to Eternal Church. My name is Josh Leftwich. I am one of the pastors here at Eternal. I get to lead the family ministry team, which is where we have all the fun at Eternal Church. Um, and this morning, most of our family ministry uh, kids are with us this morning. We have programming going on for birth through preschool, but elementary is in the room with us this morning, and we're excited about that because today is the start of Advent, and even the Grinches and the Scrooges among us must acknowledge it's Christmas. That's so exciting. And for those of us who value things like joy and happiness, our trees have already been up and dressed for a few weeks maybe, or maybe they're finally coming out this weekend. But today is the start of Advent, and we're so excited about that because in a, in a year like we've had this year, why not, right? Why not bring the joy, the happiness, the magic of Christmas out as soon as we can? And yet we also realize this year that because of the circumstances we are in, we might find ourselves at the end of this season rediscovering the simplicity of Christmas. Perhaps without as much travel, without as much standing in lines outside, without as much busyness of holiday party after holiday party, we might find as January rolls around that we've rediscovered that it's just simply Christmas. And we are excited about that. And so we're returning to, as Miss Wendy said, some of the traditions of old, the Advent candle, and the themes that come with these candles of hope and joy and peace and love and ultimately Christ, the simplicity of Christmas. And what we're so excited about is we're doing this all across campus, from babies all the way up through high school and everybody in this room. We will be learning the same scripture over the next four weeks together so that our hope is for, for the families in our church, it creates just a, a great opportunity for conversation and for you to continue that conversation on throughout the week. And so in preparation for Advent uh, this year, my wife and I have been watching the Hobbit movies and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, I'm kidding. We're, we're more reverent than that. But as we got to the second Lord of the Rings movie, The Two Towers, I was reminded of why it's one of my favorite films. In fact, it's thought to be one of the greatest battle scenes that has been in a film yet. And in this story, if you haven't seen it yet, there's, it's a story about a kingdom of men. And they're being chased from their home by an enemy. And they're fleeing to a fortress called, anybody? Helm's Deep. It's okay. You can, you can let your Lord of the Rings flag fly a little bit this morning. Lord, they're, they're fleeing to Helm's Deep. And it's a fortress that they've had in their kingdom for a long time. And as they approach the fortress, the king looks around and he tells his people, these walls are strong. This keep has never fallen. His hope is fully secured in his fortress. But there's a vulnerability. There's a vulnerability that he has long forgotten about. A small cutout in one of the walls, a storm drain, if you will, to keep the inside from flooding. And the enemy takes notice of this and begins to pack gunpowder into this cutout in the wall. And one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the film comes when one of the heroes of the story sees an enemy running with a flaming torch towards the cutout. He realizes what's going to happen and he yells to his comrade, his warrior, take him down, kill him, he yells. But it doesn't work and the, the wall is ignited. The walls are breached. And from that point on... Hope fails. Merry Christmas. This is my festive, magic-filled holiday message for us today. But, but I think it's important because there's a question we will ask today. See, Helm's Deep was not the only fortress with walls. It was not the only kingdom with an enemy. We have an enemy. We have walls in our lives meant to keep things out. So the question is, how fortified are our walls? How fortified is our hope? We're going to ask that question a lot this morning. How fortified is our hope? How would you describe your understanding of hope? A Gamecock fan, uh-oh, hopes to be a championship football team each year, though they face constant disappointment. Maybe a child hopes for a bike on Christmas morning, a middle schooler hopes for a PlayStation 5 or a youth pastor. <laughs> a high schooler hopes to get that early acceptance letter into Clemson. There's nothing wrong with these hopes. But at best, they are dependent on our good deeds met with other people's acknowledgement or appreciation. Or in the case of Gamecock fans, wishful thinking, right? It just, it's not a secured 
hope, is it? What about a, a new mother looking at her baby, her newborn baby in the midst of a COVID pandemic, hoping that this baby will stay healthy? What about a husband whose marriage is falling apart and they're hoping for a peaceful Christmas? What about a, a widower mourning the loss of his bride, hoping to find joy just for one day again? Is wishful thinking enough for these situations? Are good deeds met with the recognition of others enough to comfort our hearts in these moments? Of course not. So we need something greater. We need a greater hope. We need a more fortified hope. Turning in our text this morning, we're going to be looking at Isaiah. Specifically, we'll be looking at chapter 9. But to give us a little bit of background, Isaiah is one of the more major prophetic writings in the Bible. And his ministry spanned across 58 years in four different kingdoms and kings of Judah. His message is very clear. It's very repetitive. Sin has occurred. Sin has occurred. Judgment is coming. And yet hope remains. We see that over and over and over again. Sin has occurred. Judgment is coming. And yet hope remains. Isaiah is, is very important to the greater narrative of Scripture because he gives us one of the most, if not the most comprehensive Christologies of Jesus in all of Scripture. We see in his prophetic writings the birth of Christ, as told to us in, in ch chapter 7 and chapter 9, the proclamation of the good news or the activity that this Christ will bring. We see prophesied the suffering and the crucifixion of Christ. We see prophesied the resurrection of Christ. And we see prophesied his second coming, which is still yet to be realized. As one pastor wrote, Isaiah stands as a testament of hope in the Lord, the one who saves his people from themselves. I love that. The one who saves his people from themselves. And so the 30,000 foot view to catch us up to context this morning is that continually the people of God are turning away from their devotion to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. One of the great commands, one of the great heart strings of the Lord that he gives to his people. Worship the Lord your God, serve him only. They're turning away from that. They're giving their devotion towards idols, false gods, man-made images, ideas that promised a different kind of hope than what they thought they could expect from the God of their fathers, Yahweh. And so in the pattern of sin and judgment and hope, the sin of God's people is that they have taken their worship, therefore their trust, their adoration, their, adder, their hope, all the things that worship represents, all the things we do when we sing and raise our hands, they're taking all of that and they're giving it to empty promises from false idols. Their sin is idolatry. Next, biblical scholars often call the first 39 chapters of Isaiah the book of judgment. Because for 39 chapters in Isaiah, he speaks words of judgment against Judah, against Israel, against all the surrounding nations, ultimately against everything in the world that works against the purposes of God. So what judgment does he pronounce? Well, primarily that Assyria would come and destroy the northern kingdom and that Babylon would come and destroy the southern kingdom, taking them away into exile. Not only that, but that the people of both the northern and southern kingdoms would be taken away, right? They'd be taken from their home, from their rulers, into a foreign land to be ruled by foreign leaders. This is, in symbolic form, a return to Egypt, a reverse of the exodus, a return to captivity, to bondage, to being ruled and governed by others. And the question many ask when they come to Isaiah, or perhaps to Scripture at all, is why? Why, why does this God who says he loves his people bring judgment against his people? Why would he allow their promised land to be taken from them? Why would he allow his people to be handed over to be ruled by others? Because as is often said at Eternal, good news can only be good to the extent that we understand the bad news. In fact, the Christmas prophecies of Chapter 9 only come on the heels of one of the more gloomy parts of Isaiah, or perhaps even all of the Old Testament. At the end of chapter 8, we can read uh, in chapter 8, verse 21 and 22, Isaiah says that they, the people, will wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged. They will look upward. They will curse their king. They will curse their God. They will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and the gloom of affliction. And they will be driven into thick darkness. 
The bad news of Israel and of Judah is that they have failed to worship the Lord and serve him only. And so not only will exile come, but as C.S. Lewis so famously penned, right, the Lord will say to them, thy will be done. And by the way, if you're playing sermon bingo this morning, that's two. We've talked about Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. That's part of sharing the pulpit with Pastor Don is you have to reference the greats. So we've got two so far. But C.S. Lewis gives us this, this great picture that at the end of days, there will be those who say to the Lord, thy will be done as they are ushered into his presence. And there will be those that the Lord says to them, thy will be done, as they are removed from his presence. And in a sense, they're getting a taste of this, as the Lord is saying, you want to be ruled by others. You want to put your hope in other things. You want to be away from me and from dependency on me. Fine, thy will be done. And they will be carried off. Isaiah says a heartbreaking and yet such a thought-provoking statement in chapter 8. Where he says, shouldn't a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? What a statement. Shouldn't a people inquire of their God? Why do they look to the dead on behalf of the living? And in the moment that it's written, this was a very real, this was a very uh, a sad moment where the people are turning to every other source except for their God. And therefore, rather than finding any hope, they find distress, darkness, gloom, and affliction. And so the judgment of Isaiah is not only a physical exile, but a spiritual exile into darkness because the people have failed to turn to their God. There's some disagreement amongst biblical scholars about the timing between chapter 8, what I just read to you, and chapter 9, which we're about to read. But it's agreed that they're not continuous. It's not from one moment to the next. Meaning that at least for a time, the people of God are left with this, this promise of despair, this gloom, this, this darkness. So whether it's a few days, a few months, a few years, can you imagine the weight of living in that type of proclamation? Some of you would shake your heads and say, yes, I'm living in it right now. I can't imagine living in darkness. I can't imagine living in constant despair. I can't imagine living where there seems to be no hope. For you will find encouragement this morning. Would you stand with me with that in mind for the reading of God's word? We will be reading from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 2, going through verse 7. This is the word of the Lord. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodiest garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. Why? For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us and the government will be on his Shoulders, he will be named, say it with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this promise from your word. We tasted that, that darkness for just a moment. We, we felt that, that hopelessness for just a few seconds. And you, you have promised to rescue us from an eternity of that feeling. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and for who you say that we are, loved, chosen, and known by you. It is in your great name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Although you may want to stand and worship after such a great encouragement. Imagine, I mean, we sat in that for just a moment. But imagine sitting in that for months or maybe even years. And I love the vocabulary that Isaiah uses to bring his encouragement 
Where once there was darkness, now there is light. Where once there was despair, now there's rejoicing. Where once there was famine and the need, there, there's now a harvest. There's spoils of war to be claimed. Where once there was a council of darkness and death, now people will turn to their God and call him Wonderful Counselor. The contrast between chapters 8 and 9 is remarkable. But how will these things come to be? Where will the hope come from? Returning to my Christmas movie, The Two Towers, Helm's Deep has been breached. The king and his soldiers realize their fate. Determined to make one final stand, they ride out in their own strength to face the enemy. But they look up to the hillside and they see a rider dressed in white. That's a beautiful scene. He appears out of nowhere, right at the first light of dawn. Behind him, 2,000 soldiers. To the king, they yell, and they come down the hill, recklessly abandoning their own lives to rescue those in front of him. The light shines behind them over the hill. It blinds the enemy. They conquer them. Therefore, the hope for Helm's Deep comes at the first sight of light from outside its walls. But where will the hope of Israel come from? Where will this great light that shines on those walking in darkness come from? Who will shatter the yoke and the rod of oppression? Who will break the staff of the oppressor? I want us to look at three things. Borrowing this from another preacher, there's three terms, there's three categories I want us to look at this passage from this morning. The identity of their hope, the authority of this hope, and the activity of this hope. The identity, the authority, and the activity of this hope. The identity. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. Isaiah draws a very special attention and emphasis to the birth of their hope. Hope will come from the birth of a person. He uses two different terms to describe he who is to be born. Isaiah, along with the rest of Scripture, makes two things very clear about Jesus the Messiah. He is both fully man and fully God. And so many people have have been led one way or the other on this, claiming that Jesus was only human or that he was only divine, when in fact Isaiah gives us insight into that Jesus was both a child to be born and a son to be given. This is what we would call the incarnation of Christ, and it matters very much to the Christian faith. The late J.I. Packer spoke of this and said, I want to quote this, I think we have it up on the screen, because it's a great reading. In, In his book, Knowing God, he says, but in fact, the real difficulty, the supreme mystery with which the gospel confronts us does not lie here in the atonement, the resurrection, or the gospel miracles at all. It lies not in Good Friday message of atonement, nor in the Easter message of resurrection, but in the Christmas message of the incarnation. The really staggering Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth was God-made man, that the second person of the Godhead became the second man, determining human destiny, the second representative head of the race, and that he took humanity without loss of deity, so that Jesus of Nazareth was as truly and fully divine as he was human. This matters for us this morning because if Jesus is both the child born and the son given, then he is not simply a divine being who graced us with his presence. He is that, but he is so much more. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, the apostle Paul wrote, the first man was from earth, a man of dust, but the second man is from heaven. The first man is Adam, created by God using dust and breath designed to represent God to all of creation, yet failing miserably because of his desire to be more than he was created to be. The second man, Jesus, represents not only God to all of creation, but now represents creation back to God. Hebrews calls him the great high priest who has experiential knowledge of the trials and tribulations we face. How? Because he was born. Because a child will be born. And even though we think it's cute to sing so, it was not a silent night. He cried because he was a baby. He ate food. He learned to speak. He was not a walking theology book at two years old. 
We think about Jesus as a little baby just dropping all these. He was a baby. In Luke 2.52, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with men. He grew in that as a child. He had to learn this world so that one day he could answer our prayers and say, I understand what it's like to go through what you're going through. What a beautiful opportunity we have in that. Jesus was as human as they would come, and yet so much more, because he is also the son given. Where else do we hear that? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And if Jesus is the son who is given, then he himself is the incarnation. He is Emmanuel, God with us. His identity is a child born, a son given. God in flesh. And what of his authority? He is the son of God. The second Godhead of the Trinity. He is the hand of creation. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The earth is his footstool. Yet a manger is his bed. How perplexing. How amazing. Now what of his activity? There are gifts given to us by God which are really his attributes that he transfers to us. Not all of God's attributes are communicable, transferable to us. For example, we cannot be omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent. Where God is all-powerful, we are limited in our power. Where God is all-knowing, we are limited in our knowledge. Where God is all-present, we are limited in our presence. There are attributes we will never experience, we will never understand. And that's good news, by the way. For as it's often said, a God that can be understood is no God at all. Our Heavenly Father is superior to us in every way. He's bigger than our understanding, which means to question and to wonder is a natural part of our developing faith. That's why we intentionally create learning environments all across our family ministry designed to prompt elementary students to ask questions, designed to prompt middle schoolers and high schoolers to, to wrestle with and to gain an understanding about their own beliefs, we train our volunteers all across the board to say, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let's find out together. And parents, lean into this for a moment because we cannot, it is so important, we cannot create cultures in our homes where all things related to God are understood, therefore off the table. It is so important to create a culture in our families for our children where they are encouraged to ask questions that may not even have answers. Why? Because one day they will need a God bigger than their own or our own understanding. So encourage, create a culture of questions in your home. And, and, and there's that free answer, I, I don't know. Let's Google it together. <laughs> it's that simple. There are parts of God we will never be and we will never understand. And that's a good thing. However, there are communicable gifts, transferable attributes that God gives from himself to his people through the finished work, the activity of Christ. For when the finished work of Christ is on our lives, we are filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings about these gifts, these things like love and joy and peace and patience. These are not just virtues we decide to take on because we are good people. In fact, void of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will only be able to manufacture such gifts in our lives. I'm not as organic as some of you are here in the room. But, but manufactured fruit does not sound good. I can't imagine there's much virtue to it. I can't imagine there's much nutrient to it. I can't imagine it is very sustainable. We need the real thing. And those living by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will experience and exhibit fruit that is more pure and more sustainable and more nutritious than any product that has ever been seen. Because it is a gift from the Father given through the Son brought about by the Holy Spirit. And so our first gift of Christmas, our first gift that we celebrate, our first candle that we light is the hope candle the hope gift brought about by Jesus. Hope is not wishful thinking. It is not simply optimism or the power of positive thought. It is not based on merit or the approval of others. This hope is unbreachable. 
It's unshakable. It's un- inextinguishable. How? Because it is not from within our walls alone. It is external. It is otherworldly. It is divine. Like a, the white rider that rides over the hill to save the people who brings victory. Jesus comes from the very throne room of God. Chan spoke that during our prayer that he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but left the throne room of heaven to come to save us. In a few minutes, we'll sing a song that reads, without a sword, no armored guard, a commoner born in mother's arms. He is both the the rider who rides in to save us from the throne room of heaven, but he is also born a commoner, fully God, fully man, thus able to understand our sin condition and atone for it. He is the child born. He is the son given, the hope of nations. So it brings us back to our question, is he our hope? How, How fortified is our hope this morning? I was thinking on this, I think it was Thursday morning, meditating on this thought a little bit of this this dual role of from outside and from within. We need help from outside, yes, but not just from outside. We're very quick to look to the outside for a champion. We've become victims, I think, this year especially to lesser champions who come rushing in from the outside with a new answer. They match up with our passions and our beliefs and our convictions, and so we're so quick to rush to any talking head that looks promising enough to bring us hope. But we do not need another external champion. We do not need a champion of our earthly causes or of political movements or our passions. We need a hope that while it does come from outside, the champion of heaven does his greatest work within us. You see the difference? We are so quick to look for someone to come from outside to fix outside. And we are so resistant to a champion who comes from within to start his work here. I love going back to my Christmas movie. Most of the riders ride out to make their final stand. But there's one soldier who remembers a promise from that white rider. Most of the riders rush to their death but he rushes out to victory because he knows that hope is coming. See, it's outside and it's within. We need a champion who starts within us. The problem with these lesser champions or what Isaiah called idolatry is that what they promise to be, they can never fulfill. Think about the qualities we find in in the hope that is Jesus. What words are used to describe this baby son? Wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. When I think about the events that have transpired this year, I cannot think of a more opposite comparison to our hope. Where Jesus promises us wonderful counsel, we have been led astray by every expert this year. You just have to wait 24 hours and it'll change. Where Jesus promises us to be an almighty God, we have been failed by unmighty people over and over again. Where Jesus promises to be an everlasting father, we are met by temporal emergencies of our culture that demand our participation and then abandon us and move on to the next issue before we even begin to grasp what we're standing for. Jesus is everlasting where everything else is temporal. And of course, where Jesus promises peace, our world has thrived on hostility this year. Isaiah had it right when he said, why do you consult the dead on behalf of the living? Shouldn't a people inquire of their God? Shouldn't we? And yet every time we go to the world to tell us how to live, to tell us how to navigate the issues and concerns that we have, the very real issues, the very real problems that we experience, but when we go to the wrong source, it's not going to work. The world is dying and we're asking it how to save itself instead of bringing it to our living hope. Would you turn with me to 1 Peter? And as you do, consider that the author of this letter, this fisherman turned apostle, is living in what was one of the most vile persecutions Christians have faced under the power and the hatred of Nero. And every moment that Peter lived was one step closer to a brutal death, and yet his posture remains hopeful. Why? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, 
He writes this letter to encourage the church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is being imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable, refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How was Peter able to remain so hopeful in the face of certain death? Because he sought his hope among the living, or the living again, the resurrected Jesus Christ. And so again, how fortified is my hope this morning? I want us all to ask that question. I want us to answer that question. How fortified is my hope this morning? How many of us, like Tolkien's character, ride into the memories of past victories? And we pat ourselves on the shoulders. We say, remember when I did that? Great. Remember when this wall worked and we avoid our vulnerabilities that leave us exposed. So what happens when disappointment comes? What happens when the college rejects our applications? What happens when the election goes the other way? What happens when we receive a letter of divorce? What happens when a loved one gets cancer? What happens when darkness and gloom and despair come creeping in if our hope is not solid and secure and fortified? There is a strong sentence spoken earlier in the film, earlier in the story of the two towers, where the, the enemy of this kingdom says, if the walls are breached, the fortress will fail. If the walls are breached, the fortress will fail. So how secure are our walls? The author of Hebrews writes in the beginning of chapter 11, he says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The actual word for assurance in the Greek is this word, hypostasis, which is a compound word made up of two words, hypo, under, and histemi, to stand, which means that the faith that we have stands under our hope. Faith stands under our hope. Have you ever seen a skyscraper being built? you ever been uptown and seen them clearing the ground to build a new tower or perhaps you traveled to New York or Detroit or some of the other major cities where we have these large structures if you haven't would you imagine they begin on the ground and build up no they go below the surface some towers around the world go as much as 300 feet below ground before they begin to build upwards because the deeper the foundation goes the higher the structure can climb. In the same way, faith is the foundation on which our hope is built. Hope is the display of our faith. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the assurance, the standing under of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. A better translation than conviction would be proof. That's why Peter wrote to the church and said, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. He didn't say be ready to give an answer for your faith because faith is invisible. It's not tangible. It's below the surface. But our hope, our hope is on display. Our hope is displayed by how we react to adversity, to disappointment, to failure. It's displayed by how we treat others who let us down again and again. It's displayed by our Facebook profiles, our Twitter accounts, our Instagram stories. Our hope is what the world sees when they look at us, the church, the light of the world, the city on a hill. So when they look at us, what do they see? How fortified is our hope? Can it stand against the trials and tribulations of this world? Does it grow like a skyscraper piercing the sky, standing on a strong foundation of faith rooted deep down into the ground? I want that kind of hope. That's my goal. It's revealed when it matters most. Spurgeon, speaking of hope, said that hope is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, only to be discovered in the night of adversity. There's your third mark on sermon bingo this morning. 
to the extent that we have placed our confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ, to the extent that the bad news of our circumstances have humbled us to receive the good news that God saves his people from themselves, to the extent that we abandon all champions in search of the child born, the son given, a baby lying in a manger, our hope will shine bright for all to see. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. I pray that your kingdom has come and that your will has been done here in this place this morning as it is in your throne room where all creatures and all souls surround your throne and sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There is no conflict of attention in your throne room. There is no lesser champions being sought. There is only you, Jesus, the worthy one, the lamb who was slain, the lion of Judah. We are so quick, Father, to turn away towards hope that makes sense to us. So many of us do one of two things, Father. We look within us for hope or we look only outside of us to the world for hope when all along you were doing both. You came from the outside and you created within us new life. So Father, let us not be a church that seeks the dead on behalf of the living. Let us be a church, a people, a representation of the living hope, a hope that comes from life, comes from you, Jesus, because you are not dead. You are alive again. You are resurrected. You are our Savior, shining bright. You are the white rider coming in to rescue and you are the baby lying in a manger. And so, Father, what we've missed this morning, fill, fill in the gaps for us. What we're lacking, Father, give to us. Teach us, God. Make us humble. Make us learners this morning. Fortify our hope. You are the child born. You are the son given. You are Emmanuel. We worship you, God.